So help me God. Amen. Well, we need to learn that lesson. We seem to forget it all too often. Amen. Sermon title is not necessarily what you see on the board. We has a, it has a rendition coming. It's not just Christmas peace on earth, which is what it should be. But we are changing it up a little bit there. I hope there it goes uh, to uh, <clears throat> stress on earth. This time of year seems to be probably the most stressful time of year for many people. And unfortunately, that's the way it goes. Little boy and little girl were singing their favorite Christmas carol in church. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me one more time. If you would bring me just a plain bottle of water. Somebody back there. Thank you, brother. <clears throat> or if you got one. <laughs> Somebody put some little too much oil in that this morning. It's kind of. <laughs> put a little mint to help me breathe. But this morning it's a little thick. I think I figure I need an oil change. I don't know. <laughs> we'll let them cart my dead carcass out of here when it falls over. Amen. I appreciate it. In fact, Carol Lowry takes care of me every Sunday like that. I don't mean pick on you. I appreciate you. But not this morning. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I'm, that's got to be it. I can't take any more. Anyway, this little boy and girl was seeking to sing <coughs> their Christmas carol. They were singing Silent Night, you know, Silent Night. And it gets to that last part where it says, uh, sleep in heavenly peace. It got changed a little bit to, uh, he sang it with sleep in heavenly beans. His sister quickly rebuked him and said, it's not beans, it's peas. So. <laughs> oh. That's good. I'll put it here. <laughs> anyway, the way a lot of people feel about Christmas is that it might as well end with beans or peas because they, they hadn't found a lot of peace in it. And uh, that Christmas for many people becomes the most stressful time of the year. A lot of psychologists and doctors and sociologists will tell us that. Kind of felt that way here recently. This last week, Kathy and I both come down with a, that viral crud that goes around this time of year with the snotty noses and stuffed up heads and can't breathe and all those, all those other kind of conditions. In fact, she's still at home with it. And, uh, but uh, we're both surviving it. But there's always, at this time of year, so many things to do. And when you add to that, you know, another physical ailment on top of it, it even becomes more, more stressful. And uh, what I want to talk to you about today is in regard to that. How do we deal with this Stress when it should be at peace on earth, when Christmas time ought to be a time of celebration. All of a sudden, the culture that we live in has become a time of complete tragedy many times. There's just confusion and frustration and stress and defeat. Uh, I just made a, a, a kind of a list of potential things that happen at this time of year. And I'm sure you could add to this list yourself, all right? Send the FM ring a bell. No pun intended. All right? Shopping for gifts, obviously, on the top of the list. Getting to the holiday parties. I'm invited to all of them. Putting up the decorations, cooking a meal, wrapping the gifts, making enough cookies and breads to give away, buy a tree, fight the traffic, have enough money to buy the gifts. If you're married, figuring out when to celebrate at both sets of parents without offending the other ones. Add to that, all the stores are out of the gift you're looking for. And then there's those three frightening words, some assembly required. <laughs> Having the right clothes for that special occasion, my favorite, gaining weight, Christmas programs for the kids at school, Christmas programs for the kids at church, untangling the strands of light, sending out Christmas cards, hearing for the 150th time, grandma got run over by a reindeer, <laughs> cleaning the house, Forgetting someone you should have purchased a gift for, feeling the pressure of, to make a memory, knowing the year's coming to a close and you close and you did not accomplish what you intended to, facing the relatives you don't get along with, all your work is due on a rapidly approaching December 25th deadline, knowing that maybe you'll spend Christmas alone. Three often overlooked words, 
Batteries not included. Being a part of a family that celebrates separately because of divorce. Christmas lights after being untangled don't work. Arranging travel schedules. Missing those you love who've passed away. Paying off credit cards. Members of your family who find your presence before it's Christmas Day. <laughs> and that list could go on and on and on with all the things that kind of increase the stress level in our life. And we can see very clearly why Christmas becomes a time of increased major pressure and stress for a whole lot of people. Does the Bible have anything to say about that? I'm so glad you asked. Today's message is a little different from normal, but I believe it's an appropriate message for the season, an appropriate message for the day that we live in because the Bible does have a, a lot to say about it. In fact, in the book of uh, Luke, there's this humorous story of Mary and Martha that you're all familiar with, I believe, about Martha, Martha being busy and Mary at the feet of Jesus. I wanna speak to you about that today in regard to this message because I think it's appropriate and certainly it applies to the context of what we're dealing with. Now, as they were traveling along, he, Jesus, and his disciple entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed her, him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his words. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, now I'm gonna kind of say this the way it probably came out. Lord, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all, all, all the servant alone. Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. Well, this is a powerful message when you think about it. You know, if, we, if we're going to really enjoy the Christmas season, I think there's a lesson that we can glean from this for our own particular life about what it means to choose the, the part that can't be taken away from us. To having a Christmas celebration that leaves us with something, not depleted, not de-energized, not stressed out, not ready to kill each other. Amen? So I, I'm going to give you some, some points, simple points this morning. Obviously, I want to talk to you about first is the obvious of, of distress and what it stress is. Here's a picture of a woman who's deeply in stress. Lord, Lord, don't you care? Obviously, if you get to that point, you don't know who the Lord is. The Lord always cares. Amen. The Lord's concerned. The Lord's committed to you. The Lord cares about you. The Lord understands where you are. The Lord knows what you're going through. The problem is Martha doesn't know what's going on. All right. She's encumbered about the wrong issues. Her mindset is, doesn't anybody see how busy I am? Doesn't anybody care how much work I do for this family? Doesn't anybody see how much I put into this? Doesn't anybody appreciate all the things that I'm doing for all of you, which nobody has helped me do that I do because I love you? <laughs> Amen. Yeah, some of you act like you've been there. She comes in with the hors d'oeuvres, sets them down before Jesus, and you can just see it in her life. You can see it in her voice. You know, it's like, Mary, don't bother getting up. Don't bother getting up. I know you're trying to spend time with Jesus. I wish I had time to spend time with Jesus. And then he kind of, you know, it's kind of like Jesus, tell her what she's supposed to be doing. Straighten her out. Get her on, you know. She's, you know. Stress, you know, stress, one thing about it, it's, it's your body's alarm system. It, you know, nobody lives without some varying degrees of stress. It's just, it's just part of life as we all experience difficulties. We all experience conflicts. In fact, some stress is good for us. Some stress is bad for us. Some stress is a signal uh, in one way for something and it's a signal in another way for something else. But you know, stress is, is, is a life experience that we're all going to have to deal with. And we know clearly from what doctors tell us and what medicine and science has shown us that some stress can be, you know, uh, can lead to serious disease, intensive physical and mental injuries can cause stress. I mean, it, there's just, stress is a part of our life. Crossing a, a busy street can give you a stressful kind of mindset, you know. It, it's a mechanism within our body that says pay attention. Pay attention. All too often, we're not paying attention to the right things, though. We don't let it be the right alarm for us. It can be caused by any kind of, of, of state of arousal or alarm in our system, in our, in our life. It, it begins to mobilize our body for something. Many times it's mobilizing us for a, a defense mechanism against something or some threat or some person. 
In fact, stress can, it can result from anything that annoys you, threatens you, prods you, excites you, scares you, worries you, hurries you, angers you, frustrates you, challenges you, criticizes you, anything. It even reduces your self-esteem. can cause stress. We just get stressed about everything. We're pressured by everything. And it can be caused by things pleasant. It can be caused by things unpleasant. I started to bring a rubber band up here this morning as an illustration to stretch that rubber band out till it popped, but I did that once and it hurt so bad, I think I'd just tell you about it. <laughs> it was a great illustration until it hurt. But you can take a rubber band and you can stretch it out and what it happens to do, this rubber band is supposed to come back once it flexes back, all right? The properties are meant to expand. You know, you can deal with stress. You can live with pressures in your life. God's equipped you for that. God makes you in such a way so that you can live successfully and victoriously no matter what kind of experience you're having to go through in your life. God can give you grace and God can give you peace. But most people don't discover that. And so they're always living at that stretched out, you know, uh, issue in their life. And it's always a pressure on them. And ultimately, like the rubber band, people snap at different times. Uh, if you're held kind of in that constant state of alarm, in, in your body, your mind, there it does have damaging consequences. I, I was looking up some of this this week on symptoms of stress, and uh, these are some that you may be familiar with, or maybe you're all of them, I don't know. Frequent headaches, stiffness in your neck, your shoulders, your jaw, your arms, your legs, your hands, your stomach, irregular heartbeats, getting dizzy, getting lightheaded, suffering from colds, flus, <coughs> hoarseness, excuse me, y'all causing all the stress, indigestion, Nausea, discomfort in stomach, difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, waking up feeling tired, cold hands, cold feet, excess perspiration, angry irritability. All these are signs of stress in our life. Or many times they're signs of not handling stress properly in our life. Now add to that, you come up to the holiday season. And then you have buying of the gifts, and you've got the traffic, and you've got the mall, and you've got the pressure, and you've got the lights, and you've got the trees, and you've got the events, and all these things, you know, just seem to build up like that rubber band, stretching and stretching and stretching. What do you do about it? How do you handle that? Especially in the time when it ought to be a celebration of the Lord Jesus Christ, his coming. This is, this is the story of the gospel story of Jesus Christ is born to come redeem us of our sins. The Bible says he came to take away our sins. We talk about it's Emmanuel, God with us. Yet so many people lose the beauty and the glory and the fun, the excitement of what Christmas is really all about due to all the things that they have attached to it. What's, what's, what's the holiday cure? I believe it's found here when he says, Martha, Martha, you're so distracted. You know, you're so distracted. She's saying, don't you care? Aren't you concerned? My sister's left me to do all this serving alone. Make her help me. And that's just, that's where so many people get in their life in so many ways. We, it's, it's all about us. We've got to do for everybody else. But I wonder when, when we get so stressed out, it doesn't become about everybody else anymore. It just becomes about us and what I'm doing. And motivations are warped at that point. We miss the mark of what it's really all about. There was a guy who wrote a book uh, called The Effective Executive. And he said, the problem is not that we know how to set priorities. It's our posteriorities, which basically was saying, we don't know how to set priorities. We just do all the things that uh, first that should not be done at first, they should have been done later or not at all. You know, we, we haven't prioritized any things. Some of the things that we make priorities aren't really priorities. And we focus on the things that are of lesser importance than the things that are on greater importance. And we end up being like Martha instead of like Mary. We miss the mark, we miss the beauty of what the celebration is really all about. Look at what the Lord tells Martha. One thing is needed, Mary. One thing is needed and Mary has chosen what is better. That's, that's the message. There's some things that just may be good, but they're not the better. There's some things that may be great, but they're not the greatest. There's some things that may be nice, but they're not the nicest. They're not, they're not the priority. She realized, you know, that spending time with Jesus, Mary does, that spending time with the Lord Jesus at his feet, hearing what he had to say was more important than the external appetizers that needed to be prepared. It was more important than the other things that were happening. And Jesus makes it clear that, hey, this was what's m the most important thing. Mary's problem and all her stress was making a decision to make a priority of something that wasn't a priority. Jesus is here. He's in our midst. And I think even in our Christian lives, we get so preoccupied with serving, we forget worshiping. 
We forget who we're serving. We forget what the service is all about and the importance of who we're serving. And we get lost in what we've done instead of who he is. And we miss the mark. And then we get to that point where nobody appreciates all I do. Nobody appreciates the hours I put in my sermon preparation. Nobody appreciates the, 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 the effort that's put forth. <laughs> nobody cares. And we have our pity party and nobody shows up but us. And we still go to it and do it all over again and over again. One thing is needful at Christmas. Let me tell you what it is. It's realizing the reason for the season. It's realizing that this is all about Jesus. It's realizing to make him known. It's, and to, to worship him and to express his love and his grace. We get so busy with the other things about Christmas, we forget that it is Christ is what Christmas is really all about. We get wrapped up in the stress of the year. Let me give you, the, the message today is, is simple and it's, yeah, it's short, so you'll enjoy that part of it. But it's simple. Let me just lay out some things that will help you to get back to this place where doing what is needed uh, and, and necessary than more what you think is needed, what the true priorities are. A good place to start is here. Ready? Number one, cross out everything that takes away from the real meaning of the season of Christmas. That'll shorten your list. Because there are a lot of things that we just get involved in you know, that this, they aren't necessary. They aren't the, the, the main thing. If, if you're really stressing out, put it this way. Say you're stressing out because you make these particular cookies and everybody brags on these cookies and everybody knows about these cookies. It's those cookies, you won't even tell anybody how you make them. But these cookies, everybody's expecting them every year. But that's not a priority, all right? It may mean that you don't need to make those special cookies that take up a whole afternoon to make. When something else, perhaps a relationship, perhaps a person needs you more than cookies. You know, you don't have to put every light in the box on the house. You don't have to keep up with the Joneses nativity scene next door. You don't have to have the singing reindeer in the yard. All right. There's a time when you sit back and say, this, hey, this is really not, this is, this is not, this is not Jesus. This is not Christmas. I, I don't need that. You know, I, I, that's not necessary. In, in context of this, and this is all part of this, lay out a plan. Start with your expectations right up front. I mean, what's the main thing that needs to happen this Christmas at your house? If you're having Christmas at your house, what's the main thing that needs to happen there? If you're taking it somewhere else, what's the main thing that needs to happen there? Obviously, the main thing that needs to happen is that Jesus needs to be at the center and the focal point and the foremost part of everything that's going on. And how can I do, what can I do to plan ahead to make sure that Jesus is gonna be the theme of our Christmas? What can we say? What can we expect? I mean, and, and get to the point, if I'm laying out this plan to realize I don't have to do it all myself. I have a spouse, I have kids, I have family, I have family members and brothers and sisters. We share the load. So not one person in the whole house is doing everything that needs to be done. Along with that laying out a plan, it's good to look at your calendar. All right? It's good to make to, to lighten the calendar and see which of these events are optional. Like I said, I get invited to all the parties. And I know that I offend some people by not making all the parties. But there's no way that any man in the world could keep all those appointments. Jesus wouldn't. <laughs> not that I don't love somebody or think that, I, that, that they're important or what they're doing is important. It's just not possible in reality, all right? So to keep my sanity, and if my sanity is intact, it helps yours, all right? You realize what's optional, what's not optional. And let me say this in regard to laying out a plan, and this will save you a great deal of stress after the holidays. Stay away from credit. Yeah. Don't load up your credit cards this holiday. It is not worth it to go out and give a gift that somebody's gonna put under the sink next year and never remember it. All right? Be realistic. Set some limits. Set some spending limits and abide by them. You know, honor the Lord with your, with your finances. The Bible tells us to be wise stewards of what God has given us. We want to give, we want to be a blessing, but let's be realistic, you know. There's some things you can't afford and you don't need to go put it on a credit card and, and, and try to afford it later. You're not helping yourself, you're not helping the people you're giving to, and you're not helping your own family. You're harming them in the long run. And what you end up doing is paying for that big ticket item you probably could have bought it three times by the pay, time you paid it off if you'd saved the money the year before. So you plan ahead. 
Avoid the crisis. You know, it's not so much the gift. And it's hard to tell people that. It's, it's the fact that we're giving, we're loving, we're committing to one another, we're spending time with one another. Respect your budget. So lay out some plans and be specific. And that'll be specific to whatever you're, you're doing, whatever, what your holiday plans are. The third thing is this, put the most significant relationships first. And this is important. Obviously, the most re- important relationship of Christmas is who? Christ. It's Jesus, right? You know, we just spent about eight weeks talking about prayer and following up with lift study groups and discussions and deeper study in the word of God and our cell groups and ministries. And we spent a lot of time in prayer. And a lot of people have started praying. All too often what happens is that when that study on prayer is over, about a week or two later, everybody quits praying. <laughs> you know, we, we necessarily learned the lesson. We just kind of got on for the boat ride. But prayer needs to be a constant especially at this time of year. In Christmas time, it seems that people get so busy. Oh, I don't have time to pray. I got to get down the mall. I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to spend time with God. I, don't, I haven't got time for his word today. I'm going to put that aside. Listen, all of a sudden, you're going to lose, you're going to lose ground. You're going to lose focus. You're going, to lose, you're going to lose strength. You're going to lose your, your energy that you're going to need for everything else that goes on. He's your source. He, he's your life. He's your, you know, we, we sing that song now, Jesus is all you need. Let's start with what we need. Amen. Amen. So start with the priorities, priorities of, of your spouse. You know, I tell you, it, there's been some Christmas I've celebrated with my wife. We hardly ever see each other. She's going one way. I'm going another way. She's doing that. I'm doing this. We have to do there. We have to go over there. We have to do this. We have to do that. And we just miss it completely. I even take some time for each other during this time. Take time for your family. Don't neglect your family at this time for what seems like other obligations. You regret it later in life. You regret it later in the world. You know, so keep family at the focus. Your closest friends who feel like family, make them part of what's going on. If we understand anything about Christmas, it's this. It's fellowship. God sent his son so that we might know him, might walk with him, spend time with him. He would be our life. He brought us into relationship. He brought us into family. And so many people forget that. Now, yesterday at lunch, we, uh, yesterday we had the, uh, our annual December uh, Christmas widow's banquet. And by the way, Pam and her team, you guys were just phenomenal. If you were there, just give them a hand. Amen. You know what I'm talking about. It was phenomenal. They had everything so well laid out. It was beautiful. The food was great. The room was great. Speaker was great. Everything was just in- incredible. And, you know, it was a time for us just to honor widows in our church and uh, to remind them that we love them, we care about them, and have just a time of special fellowship with them. But that's what Christmas is about. It's about fellowships. You know, it's, it's, about, it's about getting together and spending time with people who matter and people you love and people you care. Don't make it so that you're so busy with Christmas dinner and Christmas preparations. And all that. You just, you missed family. You just missed it. And the day is done and you're laying your weary head on your pillow and you say, oh, I wish I'd spent time with so-and-so. So it doesn't have, you don't maximize the things in the event, maximize the people in the event. Focus on the people that are important. Sitting at the table there, we, we were, were gathered around, we're talking. There was one lady there who was a guest of someone. I don't know if you're here this morning or not. I don't think she'd mind me sharing what, what we were talking about. She was talking about the fact that, she, you know, she hadn't been regular in church, that she was kind of one of those wounded people and kind of been on the outskirts and things, and dealing with those issues. And I just tried to share with her. And I said, you know, too many times we get to looking at church as just a, the organization. It's something we do. I do church on Sunday. And we don't realize what church is. Church is family. Church is fellowship. Church is where we worship our Father, our God together. Church is where we love Jesus together. It's all about people. It's all about God. It's all about us coming together. It's a functioning body. And if church is what you do, then you've missed the mark, you know. It's kind of check it off the list for the day. And you don't enjoy church like that. Enjoy church, you come in, you love each other, you love God together, you worship God together, you praise the Lord together, and you enjoy the fellowship. I said, when I began to understand that church it, the church is the bride of Christ. It got me thinking, hey, this is my bride. And I put my arm around my wife and said, this is Kathy. She's my bride. I love her. I want you to love her. Said, this church is the bride of Jesus. You know, we need to love his bride because we are that bride and we participate in it. The whole idea here is, is it gets back to this, this relationship issue of, 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 of caring and loving and committing to one another. So put those relationships, and especially the most significant relationships first. The fourth thing, look for the spiritual dimension in everything you do this season. If you're decorating a tree, make it a Jesus tree. Make it all about the Lord. 
If you're preparing a meal, the Bible says, whatever you do, do is unto the Lord. If you're wrapping gifts, make it about Jesus. Hey, you know, there's been times when Kathy and I've sat and prayed over our gifts that we were giving people. You know, that they would see the message. They'd sit, get the heart of what was being done. You know, just make it, make it that, that it's, this is about Jesus, you know, about welcoming him into our hearts, welcoming him to this world, welcoming him into our life, and presenting him to other people as well. Wise men gave gifts that everything that's been given to us by the wisest of all, which our Father God is the greatest gift of all, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Just, hey, if you're at the mall and you're having to shop or you're at the grocery store, make it about Jesus. Tell people, Merry Jesusmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Happy birthday, Jesus. Don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated. Be bold. This is your opportunity. What am I saying? Just make it, spiritualize it. That's all I'm saying. We get so involved in the physical aspects of getting, doing, checking off the list. We just forget, hey, this should be, this should be about a celebration of birth and the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a celebration of life. So whatever you're doing, however you're doing it, make sure it all focuses on Christ. Because everything of this season ultimately does. The lights, it's about Jesus. The, light of the, world. the trees are about eternal life. The gifts are about the greatest gift of all. The wise men offering their gifts. It's just a symbol of, of worship to the greatest gift, which is Jesus Christ. So everything, the colors even of Christmas, the message of Christmas. It's all around us. Use it for the glory of God. Speak it out. Share it with others. Talk to people about Jesus. This is your opportunity as much as any other time, Eastern Christmas, for a secular world to hear the message of the gospel from people. We're filling the stores. We're filling the centers of shopping places. We're, we're going to the malls. We're, we're getting to the groceries. Hey, wherever you go, take Jesus and make him big wherever you go. The last thing is this. Focus on those who are in need. One of the reasons we do our Christmas offering in regard to missions at Christmas is because this is what Christmas is all about. It's giving. We, through our church, we support a lot of missions. We, we, we support a lot of missionaries in our church. We support it through the Southern Baptist Convention. We support it through the Texas Baptist Association of, in, in the state of Texas. We support it through a local association of the South, South Texas Baptist Association where we as a church, we're giving to mission endeavors and new church plants. Our, our church individually gives to new church plants that we want to see get started and we want to help out. Over the years, we planted four or five churches and helped churches get started. These, these are all things we do all year long. At Christmas, we're, we're focusing on some special missions, right? our Bulgarian missions and our, our Belizean missions and what we do in Central America. Just this last week, we were able to put out 10,000 new Bibles for Christmas in Bulgaria. Cash paid for right out the door. Now, these, these are not cheesy little cheap Bibles that are made out of paperback. These, these, are, these are bonded, bound books that are bound the old way where they're really stitched and everything else because these are Bibles that we've been several hundred thousand now that we have printed because we want them to last for years. And we've made these Bibles. We don't charge for these Bibles. We have printed these Bibles through Impact International. Our church has been on supporting that for years and years and years, almost as long as they've been in place. And we've been printing up hundreds of thousands of Bibles as a gift. Those Bibles are shipped to a, to a local manager there in Bulgaria for us who is a pastor. He takes those and presents them to the local denominations, the national denominations. They're in a warehouse where those denominations, the Baptists come get them out. The, 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 the Pentecostals come get them out. The Assemblies of God come get them out. And they just go out to all the denominations. The Methodists get some, the Lutherans get some. They're, they, depending on their basic size of those denominations, a percentage is given out. And this happens every year. Sometimes it's 20,000 Bibles, sometimes it's 10,000 Bibles, sometimes it's 25,000 Bibles. But over the years, we're up over a couple hundred thousand Bibles now that are being printed. That's what Christmas is about, giving. That's what our missions are about. That's the whole message of Christmas is mission. Jesus was the first foreign missionary. <laughs> For real, amen? He came into an alien world. He came and became one of us and gave himself for us, the ultimate sacrifice for all of our sins. So we give it, we give it, Christmas. We have a food pantry, you know, and that Louise even say something about there's information you build. All those things are our clothing pantry. All this is about giving. This is the time we ought to be filling our pantries up more than ever for gifts and for giving. But let's not ever forget, you're going to pass people. There's going to be people in your community. There's going to be families perhaps in your community that you can do something for more than just your family. 
So be sure that when you look at your Christmas items that you can realize that, hey, I need to be sure to focus not only on the spiritual dimension and relationships and making sure that things are in order in my house, but there are people around me that God's going to show me who they are and introduce me to that need. And I want to be available to you. And you pray that way. God, show me how I can be effective in somebody's life or family this year. You'll be surprised at what God will do in you and with you and for you. I made the little joke at the beginning of the message about the little boy who was singing Sleep in Heavenly Beans and Peas. Uh, Gary Cannon's wife, Barbara, came up to me at the end of the service as I was leaving. She said, that's kind of funny, but I'll tell you what happened to me. She says, our son, our grandson was singing in a Christmas musical several years ago when he's, you know, four or five years old. And he was supposed to be singing, Oh, Come All You Faithful. And she said, I kept listening to him sing. And I finally got to him after the program. He says, what were you singing on that song, Oh, Come? He says, Oh, Come On, Be Faithful. <laughs> I said, I like, I like that better. <laughs> oh, come on, be faithful. <laughs> let's be faithful. Let's remember Christmas is about Christ and let's be faithful to honor him this Christmas. And our celebration will be about Christmas. Keep it about the Lord. Hey, we have a Christmas Eve service. There's a lot of programs you can go to. One you ought to remember is a Christmas Eve service at your church to fellowship with the family of God. And that service is about one hour long, but I want you to know that one hour will have a lot of stuff in it that'll be a blessing to you and to your family. And it'll get you focused on the day that's going to be coming that following morning. That's keeping it all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not going to give a formal in invitation, all right, this morning. All right, so the man doesn't need to come. But I do want to say that it's important to use this opportunity of Christmas in a way that will impact your world and your family for Jesus Christ. One thing I've always enjoyed about Christmas with my mom was always about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. You know, growing up, our kids were to understand it's all about Jesus. Before we open presents, Dad's going to read the Christmas story. <laughs> We're going to read the Christmas story. I know it's hard. And all those little presents are gleaming under the tree, calling your name. Yeah. But hey, let's keep it always about Jesus. No matter how old they get, we still do it. We still do it. We still talk about Jesus. We still pray. We still honor the Lord Jesus Christ. My prayer is that you will do the same. Amen. And let's honor the Lord in this way. Scripture closes this morning, very simple, Luke 2. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, stress among men, peace among men with whom God is well pleased. That should be our heart's cry, peace on earth. Jesus said, I've come that you might have peace. We're living in a world that doesn't know a lot about peace today. People live in fear, in tension, doubt, fear. Jesus said, I've come to overcome this world, and through me you can have peace. Praise God in the Lamb. Let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your grace today. I pray that you would help us each prioritize the...